everyone, and welcome back to Play Pause Rewind. Uh, we are on our 28th episode. Our show is turning a year old. And uh, yeah, it's been a little bit. Niles, how have you been since our last recording session? Great. Very busy. Very, very, very mm-hmm. busy in all aspects of my life. Um, but not too busy to record this podcast because yep. we love you fans, whoever's listening, and we just also love talking about film and media and stuff like this. This is just always such a fun time. Uh, Dylan, how are you doing? I am doing very well. Uh, also had a busy few weeks. Um, went down to Texas for a little bit, but uh, back. Excited to talk about Arcane. Um, yeah. Yeah. This came out a little while ago, but this is one of my favorite things from last year. So I really want to talk <laughs> about it. Um, and yeah, so we'll do brief non-spoilers at the start, and then we will just dive in after that. Niles, um, non-spoilery thoughts on Arcane. Definitely one of the better or even best series of 20, 2021. You know, mm-hmm. I think that this, it's, I, I'm such a fan of like animation in general. Like ever since I was a kid, you know, growing up, cause I grew up with the Simpsons, you know, that was like yeah. such like a mainstay of my house. Like if you know me, you know that I love the Simpsons and like, I just enjoyed a lot of those adult animations and anime. That stuff was really fun for me when I was a kid mm-hmm. and to see this kind of series, it's just got everything that I could want in just an animated series. It's got gorgeous animation just stunning visually it's got a fantastic narrative all the way through it's got interesting characters it's complex it's multifaceted it's just like it is such a treat of a series and it i can completely understand why it took them six years to make this (laughs) yeah yeah and i i agree wholeheartedly and weirdly in america it's only in america i think but like we have this association of cartoons and animation just being a thing for kids, which is Mm -hmm. fucking dumb. And um, like the rest of the world knows that. And even the things that are for kids are great, but this is for adults for Mm -hmm. sure. It is also um, an adaptation of League of Legends, which is like, I have played MOBAs. I have since this came out played League. And it's like, there is no story in that genre of game. That's not part of it, which is why it is so shocking that this is, in my opinion, by far the best video game adaptation in film and television. Yeah. Like not even close. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like I think I, you know, I've never played League of Legends. I have never even tried to because that just like it's a whole other complicated world where it's like, yeah, I'm not even gonna touch it. Um, I'll stick with my other video games. Thank you very mm-hmm. much. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, you know, I'll play some more Legend of Zelda. That's fine with me. I'll mm-hmm. do that forever um so i don't really know a lot about league of legends i think you know a lot of, a little bit more about barely it. but um, uh, well you were more into dota right I, yeah i played dota which is why i was able to like try league because league is less complicated dota i'm sure there are a bunch mm-hmm. of league fans who will be very upset by that statement but the <laughs> there it's an incredibly complicated genre of game and there is no story present in it um oh what's the developer riot Riot Games is trying to build out the lore of Runeterra, I think, is the world. And there are more games than just League of Legends now. There is a like a JRPG style game. There's Team Fight Tactics, which is an auto battler with their characters that I've actually started playing and is super fun. But they are trying, they're putting in a big effort to um, build this out into a property. And there's a card game, too, called Legends of Runeterra. Um, So there's like a lot of shit in this universe now, but this show one, you don't need to know anything about league of legends and you're probably better off not knowing. I didn't know anything about it. (laughs) Yeah. Seriously. Well, you, yeah, like you said, you don't need to know anything about the series or the video games or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Cause it's just, it is, it just stands out on its own so well. Like um, we'll kind of get into this a little bit later, but to me, um, this series kind of feels like an animated version of the wire. Um, okay. Not to say that like, this is the best animated series ever, but the thing about the wire is that it's like, it's, it's such a multi-layered series, mm-hmm. you know, every single shot of that series has been well thought out. There's intention behind everything. And then 
you have this complex cast of characters where they're not exactly heroes they're not exactly villains everyone's complex every season is a little bit different and it shows how you know um the drug trade feeds into the schools and then you know the schools kind of influence the newspaper and the newspaper Mm -hmm. influences politics like it's like it's very complicated and i can see a lot of those similar elements in arcane because you have like all these different like the people up top the the council their Mm -hmm. decisions impact the undercity and then the undercity then has to resort to the drug trade and like all this other right. stuff. Like I said, it's so funny it, or not funny. It's just like, it's very meticulous, I guess. It, yeah. It's like it. about, it's sort of like the systemic nature of a city that doesn't care about half of its people. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and we'll think, get more into that later. I'm sure. But yeah. And that's, a, and that's a big thing about the wire too, is that you could make the argument that the wire isn't about like the cops or, you know, the the drug trade or anything mm-hmm. like that it's about a city the 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 show is just focused on the city of baltimore like trying to tell the story of what that city is and i see a lot of that here in arcane mm-hmm. as well that it's really trying to like define a little bit of what it is to be a city you have the un- upper upper class you have the middle class you have the lower class or whatever and mm-hmm. there's all the, everyone's got these com- conflicting opinions and points of view it's it's um yeah, it's 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 complex. <laughs> yeah, but the I mean the animation we talked about it's very stunning. I think yes, it is the most noticeably good animation I've seen in a thing since Spider Verse. Mm, um, yes, I and uh, the one one good thing or one intelligent thing I think this show did because League of Legends has something like 160 characters in it, and the show very wisely focuses on a few. <laughs> yes <laughs> um and uh without spoiling anything yet the series focuses mostly on a character named vi and her younger sister powder growing up in the undercity of piltover the city of progress and uh it introduces a wider cast of characters sort of slowly throughout the first arc and um mm-hmm. it, I, i'd say we have a main cast of probably seven or eight main people that we follow and that yeah is perfect for the the series as it goes. And now, like, I'm sure they'll introduce more in season two and beyond. But good to start small and focused um, than to do too much too fast. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that is kind of a thing about video game adaptations is where the scope just isn't like where it should be, you mm-hmm. know, like maybe they're focusing on too many characters or maybe they're focusing on like just one character when it's like, this is a more complicated game than just like, you know, this one person, like, right. You know, so I think, yeah, the scale and the scope, they did a really good job with that. Um, yeah. That was a also failing of like the Warcraft movie actually is yes. like that. The thing is barely two hours long and we had eight primary characters who we were supposed to care about all of them by the end. And it, you can't, there wasn't enough time. <laughs> yeah. But this series is a good job because you got, yeah, that core cast of eight characters or what have you. And they stretched it out over nine episodes. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's a lot more time for you to get to know these characters, kind of fall in love with them. And, uh, you know, throughout that, yeah, the animation is just stunning. It's amazing. And, you know, I think one of the things that I was really expecting when I saw the title of League of Legends on it, you know, I was expecting more fantastical elements because mm-hmm. I just kind of associate those kinds of games like Dota and League of Legends with kind of like, wow, like World of Warcraft a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. So I kind of was expecting some dwarves or some elves or like, you know, some kind of fantastical elements. But I'm super glad we got what we did with the yeah. with this direction. And I, and I think all of that does exist in this universe. It's just um, the world building is hyper-focused on this city for now, which is really a neat approach to take. Like we get hints at this broader universe and uh, magic and stuff like that. Um, And a couple non-human characters, but not, not that many. So Mm -hmm. it's, and I think we'll get more of the different parts of the world as the show goes on. But for now, it's like the city of Piltover is a location we're very familiar with because of how focused the show was. But yes. Yeah. And uh, one other thing too, you know, because it's a video game, I feel like, or or because it's an animated show mm-hmm. i one of the things that i like about animated shows is that like you know they can show things that aren't 
necessarily realistic. They can show crazy action sequences. They can show these fantastical things where they're doing crazy backflips and, you know, no one's at risk of getting hurt because it's mm-hmm. animated. <laughs> um, and so I think this, this series had a great, um, you know, expression of like amazing action, like just the artistry was in like every single like action sequence. And you could really feel that kind of like the balance and the, like, you know, people weren't just fighting for the sake of fighting. Like there was always a reason why characters were fighting, like it was driving mm-hmm. the story along, but there was, you know, there was something deeper there. And I really appreciated that. Yeah, I, I agree entirely. Um, and just lastly, before we get into spoilers, I think um, I was just shocked at how good this was. Uh, yeah, I, I tempered, I thought the trailer looked really cool, but I really tempered my expectations because video game adaptations don't have the best track record. I have enjoyed a few, but uh, none of them have been great until now. (laughs) Assassin's Creed. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) That movie fucking sucks. (laughs) (laughs) It's such garbage. It was so Um, bad. And I don't say that about movies that often, but Assassin's Creed fucking sucks. This is so bad. Oh, God. Um, This, on the other hand, is fantastic. And, Mm -hmm. you know, before we kind of dive into spoilers you know i was really fascinated by the title as well arcane Mm -hmm. so i looked up the definition this is pulled right from google it is quite literally understood by few mysterious or secret oh good (laughs) (laughs) and i think that's a great word to choose for this show especially because like i see so much of the wire in here Mm -hmm. and to this this series to me to a certain extent it definitely feels like it's a representation of um human nature to a degree and i hope i don't repeat that too much on this podcast uh because i feel like i do say that a little bit a lot sometimes but you know i mean it's it's relevant a lot too though it is (laughs) it is um but you know there's like you you see these characters in this in this series who are um they have such good intentions and as they go through this the, the story they become corrupted or consumed by this obsession mm-hmm. of helping others and then you have these uh, bureaucratic systems um that are designed to keep people safe and you know um protected and moving forward and they're just ineffectual and rigid and then there's people who are you know really progressive and they're like we need to change the world or like they're resistant mm-hmm. to change and then their world just completely flips and you know this series does a really good job of like illustrating trauma as well i feel like especially in our main characters of i Mm -hmm. uh, powder um, which we'll get into a little bit more later but you know i think there's just so many ways that you can look at this series and say that is really representative of what it is to be human and what it is to kind of exist in um you know a city like piltover or baltimore or denver or you know chicago or something like that you know i think there's a lot of different ways that you can look at Mm -hmm. the events of this uh, whole series yeah it's about human nature it's about class um yes and class 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 is a big part of it i think uh which we'll (laughs) definitely get more into yeah in in just a second oh whoops oh (laughs) we both tried to click that we talked about these points at the same time and unclick them. Okay, we're good. Uh, you want to do spoilers? We're, <laughs> we're caught up. We got we ain't got no class over here. <laughs> no. Um, should we do spoilers? Yes, let's do okay. spoilers. Let's jump on in. So the structure of this show was unique for Netflix. Um, there are three arcs of three episodes each, and you know Netflix normally just drops everything at once, which I have grown to hate. Uh, and they didn't do that this time. They uh, did, Mm -hmm. it was over three weeks and you got three episodes a week. And I think that at least I I know you watched it much later, but like for me, I really benefited from that. And I think the show did as well because each arc kind of ends on a pretty dramatic note and you just have a week to ponder that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it really built up a lot of hype and it really made the show have more momentum than it would have had if it had just been out in a week. Like, the Witcher season two, I thought was pretty good. Fucking forgot half of what happened in it. Um, yeah, I still and, haven't finished it. <laughs> um, but this, especially that first arc, which I'm sure you want to talk about based on your notes, like the ending of that hit me hard. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I was just like, I need to know what's next all week. So, <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think. I think you said this too, like you were texting me about it and it was like, you know, each of these arcs really does feel like a movie, mm-hmm. you know, 
you can sit down and you can watch three episodes, like the first arc in a night and be like, wow, that was a fan. That, that, that just felt like I, a whole narrative. Like it had an arc, it had a middle ending, mm-hmm. you, you know, it's, I think, yeah, that, that kind of release schedule, Netflix really needs to kind of adapt to that and just make that the norm. Cause yeah. I totally agree when something is released all at once, people binge it in one day and they forget about it like stranger things or mm-hmm. yeah like the witcher you know it's like super quick it's done it's had its moment in the sun and it only lasted a day like yeah and there and it's like you want to engage in in discourse around it and talk about it with people but it's like if you don't watch the whole show in the first 12 hours it's out people are already talking about the ending because people suck so you just mm-hmm. you either binge the whole thing in a day or you miss out on the entire conversation and it's that's fun like and that's why, um, I don't know, it's why something like Game of Thrones became so huge over the years. It's because, like, every Monday, people would be talking about it with each other. Yeah. And that's, that's what builds up, a, a, like, a fandom and a culture around a show is having time to actually talk to people about it. Um, yeah. So, and I think Arcane got that. <laughs> like, there is a mm-hmm. strong fandom for Arcane online now, like, less people in our lives outside of the internet, I think have watched it, but it's like, it's an easy recommend to anybody, I think. Yeah. I, before we, yeah, before we go much further, yeah, I'll just say, you know, I have very little to complain about with this series. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, yes, I do have some notes on like the, on like the first arc, um, which we can get to in a bit, but yeah, like overall, so much of this series is just like, just, just breathtaking yeah like i just can't think of like another word for it it's stunning it's gorgeous like i can't pay the show and the creators like enough compliments for that six years of work that they put in Mm because it's just fan fucking tastic it's entertaining it's gorgeous um but uh yeah so i mean should we talk well we'll should we, I guess, maybe give like an overview of what happens? In this, yeah, in this it, like on a super high level, like yeah, it's um, like our main sisters, uh, Vi and Powder, or Jinx. Um, they sort of start out in the Undercity with their little group of friends. They have an adoptive father in Vander, and then it sort of follows their two paths as they diverge due to a lot of tragedy early on. And then we, we are introduced to other characters along the way, like um, idealistic scientist Jace and his mm-hmm. uh, lab partner and friend Victor. We meet Caitlin, who is like the one good cop, basically, in the yep. city. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, it, the cast sort of slowly expands from there. But I would say the main, our main like core characters are Vi, Caitlin, Jinx, and uh, Jace and Victor, and then everybody else sort of exists to support their arcs. And, yeah. Um, but yeah, in our, our first arc, uh, we should just talk about that a little bit. Um, it's, they're younger. There's a time jump after episode three. And mm-hmm. um, that's the arc that really sets up the world. And uh, you had some thoughts about that. So what do you want? Yeah, yeah. So I think my, like, I think the first episode is, excellent you know mm-hmm. i think that's like just a just a good one in general because it really sets the scene it establishes the characters and it really sets a tone for what you can expect for the series my big problem with this first with this first arc well i guess i'll just explain the arc first you know so um <laughs> we're introduced to the characters and they um vi and powder they go along with their group of friends on this little like kind of panty raid i guess we'll call it where they go and they kind of like rummage through this guy's apartment and steal some stuff and then they cause like a big Mm -hmm. explosion um or powder does and then that sets in like it 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 sets the things in motion uh, for the rest of the series that explosion you know they kind of get caught about it um but then vander's trying to kind of be the middleman and kind of like negotiate a little bit and Mm -hmm. you know because he's he's established this precarious balance between the undercity and the, uh, the rest of Piltover. The enforcers, so, you know, you got the cri- yeah. yeah. You got the yeah, crimes. He has, he has that relationship with that one with like the sheriff. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, that voice actress, I, I love, she has a really distinctive voice. Yes. She's in uh she's in Star Trek beyond as well in like one scene. Oh. And uh, she's in something else coming up too, but she has like that really gravelly cool voice um yeah i was was sad she died i like i like that performer a lot (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah, and I agree. She's she's got a really good presence in her voice. Like the voice acting all around is great. I think mm-hmm. everyone's got such a such a good yeah. presence. Haley Steinfeld voices. again, same. same yes, Haley Steinfeld. Episode. <laughs> she did fantastic um, in this one and in Hawkeye. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, things kind of start to go awry when uh, crime Lord Silco, I suppose, um, has his beef with Vander. He kidnaps Vander um, and he's got this whole plot with um, this with the shimmer, um, which kind of like brings out the inner monster of people. And he mm-hmm. kind of considers it a little bit, I guess, to a degree, like the next evolution. Um, but I think his more his main prerogative is like establishing the country or, or the separate city of Zon, mm-hmm. um, which we get into later. But, you know, the arc finishes uh, with um, Powder basically fucking everything up. Um, <laughs> she causes this big explosion and basically kills all of her friends. Um, I guess I guess they were really friends, but, you know, the gang, she kills yeah. the gang. Incidentally, I know it was an accident, but then she also kind of kills Vander in the process as well. And Silco has his, you know, his he kills him as well. So it's not entirely Powder's fault. But the biggest thing that I have, the, the biggest problem with I, that I have with this arc is that third episode. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to stress this here. I understand. <laughs> I understand she's a child, and I understand that her actions set in motion a far more interesting plot um (laughs) you know it leads to the creation of this character called jinx um and it's her own kind of way of dealing with the trauma and the tragedy of vander's death and like her separation from her sister vi because they get separated at the end of episode three Mm -hmm. thing that i really don't like is that i just don't believe that a a kid would do that like (laughs) am i alone here like um well i i disagree Uh, i love it um, and yeah. I, th- I think what she did was stupid, but I yes. do also think the first couple episodes do a really good job of showing us that she wants to be a valuable part of the team. Like that's sure, really yeah. important to her. And I think she also has some sort of um, instability as well. Uh, mental instability. Like she's not, she needs some form of therapy. I'm not sure what, and I, I don't, I don't know if this show is a positive or negative depiction of mental illness. And I don't really want to go down there because I'm not knowledgeable enough to do that. Um, But she's not totally um, in control of her emotions. And then at a critical moment, um, and and she like Milo, one of the other kids, like shits on her all the time. So she's trying to prove herself um, to Vi and everyone else. And then at the critical moment, Vi's like, you have to stay here because you're a little kid. Like, we can't, this is too important for you to participate. And the reason mm-hmm. I love um, what Powder does is because like we see this arc all the time in movies and shows, right? It's like yes. the, the fuck up comes in at the last second and saves the day with like a clutch move. Like they finally get it to work and it's building up to be like that. But then it takes a twist because you see before she interferes, like they're good. They've got it. Like Vander is free. Yep. Um, exactly. The, the big guy with the glasses, like got the hole, they're ready to go. And then, um, and then she fucking kills all of them. <laughs> and, yeah. And I love the, it's so dark and I think it's so cool. <laughs> and no, um, yeah, it's, it's a good ending for that little arc. And mm-hmm. it definitely sets up like such an interesting narrative moving forward. Yeah. It's and it, and my... she's so happy that yeah. she did. She's so happy And she goes up and she goes up and like Vi hits her, which is really sad because she's like, because she's just like mourning Vander and not understanding what happened. And then she's like, what the fuck? You did this? You killed everybody. (laughs) I think it's, Mm -hmm. I thought it was so cool. (laughs) Yeah, I, I think it's neat too. It's just to me, I just feel it's a little unbelievable because, you know, she wasn't, I mean, she didn't maybe necessarily remember the events that happened on that bridge during the slaughter of like the mm-hmm. uprising or whatever, but you know, she's got to have some idea of what happened. You know, mm-hmm. she's got to have like some, I don't care if she's like 10, 11 or 12. It wasn't very clear how old she is, but you know, I guess if she's like under 10, she gets a pass in my book. But like, you yeah. know, if she's like about well, 11 she was or even 12, younger at the bridge, remember? Because Vi yeah, was yeah, little was... in that. So she was probably mm-hmm. like four or five in that scene. Yeah. So, I mean, if she if she doesn't have an, a super clear memory of that, that's fine. But, mm. you know, I feel like as a kid, you're like 
10 or 11, you should start to have like an understanding of what the gravity of your situation is. Mm -hmm. And like, you're in the underworld, you have a foster parent, you know, this is a very delicate situation. He just caused this huge accident. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, any other kid, she's not any other kid. She's jinx. She's powder. So Mm -hmm. I just feel like any other kid would have said like, you know what? Okay. Yeah. I know what I'm, what I'm best at. I shouldn't go. So I think that's just my problem. My problem is this is like, it just feels a little unbelievable, unbelievable to me that okay. she would make that action, but she's a kid. It advances the plot. So I'm willing to overlook that because it does create a very interesting story. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I do agree that like in the scene where she's left alone and she just starts like freaking out and crying, it's kind of like, okay, fucking chill. But but mm-hmm. I, th- I also don't think it's outside of her personality to have that freak out and want to take action. Um, and totally. I, I, I just love the subversion of the trope that we get with that. Um, yeah. And it, it leads to a lot of really interesting stuff, too. It does. Yeah. And, you know, I think Jinx, honestly, she turns out to be one of my favorite characters of this mm-hmm. of the story, like in those in the last two arcs. She's just so chaotic, unhinged, and crazy, and she's trying to grapple with, like, her own mental illness and, like, mm-hmm. you know, the trauma that she's experienced with her parents dying and then all of her family kind of dying or abandoning her. It's, like, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Vander a little bit, too. I think he's a, yeah. he's a super interesting character in the first arc because he is, like, and it, it's a little undercooked, I think, his relationship with Silco and whatever they had um, mm-hmm. before. But it seems like they were both like revolutionary brothers in arms at one point. And I'm curious what led to that fight in the in the water where Vander's just like beating the shit out of him. But I, I love how he's like the bartender and the broker of peace and sort of the, the keeper of the status quo almost, which is super mm-hmm. interesting and how he he's like mellowed in his old age and is trying to impart that wisdom to Vi who just wants to like fight um, because she's a kid and doesn't Mm -hmm. fully understand the consequences of that and how like their little jaunt into Piltover just kind of fucks up a lot. (laughs) Yeah, it really does. Um, Yeah. I, I think Vander, he's all right. He, you know, he feels that good trope of the old wise man who's kind Mm -hmm. of, yeah, the broker of peace. He's yeah imparting his wisdom, and I I did appreciate him. That said, I'm glad they killed him off. Uh, oh yeah, it's it's the right move for sure. But his mm-hmm. um the, his final fight was awesome in that, that on that was, bridge. That was a really cool sequence, mm-hmm. and like yeah, I agree. I want to know more about his yeah his relationship with Silco and what exactly was their disagreement. They might have told us a little bit in the series, but like it was that was the third episode like i'm yeah that's yeah they, they don't dive into it a whole lot and i'm i'm kind of thinking they might never because both those guys are dead now i don't know if there are any other characters who know the nature of that relationship so it'll be interesting to see if we ever find out more mm-hmm. yeah but. well before we dive too much into other characters you know i mm-hmm. think it's worthwhile to just kind of pause for a moment and reflect maybe very briefly we don't have to talk about them too much but like vi and powder you know because i think they are the core of the show uh these two sisters they are protagonists and it is very interesting to see how their paths diverge Mm -hmm. and their dynamic grows as well because it really starts off as this caring protective older sister and the naive younger sister they're kind of like mentor mentee kind of trying to teach her trying to protect her but at the same time you know powder wants to do more she doesn't want to be treated like a kid mm-hmm. and then as the series goes on it it just becomes far more complex um and they both have their kind of different ways um as we see as the series goes on of dealing with this heavy trauma and tragedy from their childhoods yeah totally and it's um and i mean that plays into the culmination of the first act too is like powder's big thing is like her her shit doesn't work None of her little grenades like work properly, which is why it's such a, which is why I love the subversion so much. It's like, it finally works. Yay. Oh no. You killed everyone. Oh, Oh, all of your friends. It (laughs) works too well. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, I, I like them both a lot. And I think it's super one fucked up that 
Sheriff Marcus just like kidnaps Vi and sticks her in a prison for, I think it's supposed to be like seven years that she's just yeah. abandoned there with no cause. Um, I guess he's protecting her from Silco is I'm sure how he justifies it to himself, but, and how um, Vi's abuse of her little sister at the end, like throws her right into the hands of a, a creepy like criminal kingpin and uh, mm-hmm. like fucks up her mental health for the rest of her life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because like yeah, you have a you have a pretty unstable little child who realized she just murdered like her father figure and two of her friends being thrust into the manipulative hands of a, a kingpin. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very bizarre. Um, but it's also interesting to just see how those characters um change mm-hmm. over time too. You know, they both lean heavily into the things that they, you know. That they, that they learned when they were kids, you know, Vi yeah. becomes really good at boxing, you know, or even better, like she mm-hmm. becomes an even better fighter and Jinx just becomes like this mastermind of like explosives. And it's like, wow, I didn't, I mean, I knew that she was going to get better, but I didn't realize that she was going to be like on kind of the same level as the Hextex bros, mm-hmm. like over there. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Her techno, her technological capabilities are pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think, um, yeah, we don't have to talk too much about the mental illness stuff because, yeah, we're clearly not experts in that field. Um, but I do kind of appreciate how they attempted to portray um, her mental illness, Jinx's, um, mm-hmm. you know, because she's clearly got some deep rooted trauma, but she's also hearing these voices because of that trauma, because she killed those friends. And, um, you know, we see that in that kind of final scene. Mm -hmm. um at the dinner table when everyone's kind of tied up and all that stuff and she's got she's like shut up i'm trying to think it's like well and that that scene where she lights the flare and the camera is going around her and you see like the imaginary corpses of the friends she blew up like leaning against her back like it's really haunting um Mm -hmm. i just don't know what specifically they were trying to portray which is why i hesitate to say it was a good depiction um yeah but i i that's my own ignorance shining through as well. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, we shouldn't speculate on what it was, but um, yeah, I think the, the dynamic uh, between them is very interesting. And, mm-hmm. you know, I am excited to see, you know, uh, what happens next for Vi. And, you know, cause I'm just kind of assuming that power, that like, Jinx is dead by the end of it. Not, not to get too much into the spoilers, but, you know, um, I, I, it is, I'm kind of interested to see how Vi will grapple with this trauma moving forward mm-hmm. in the next season and um, how that dynamic, if Jinx survived. Um, she, we'll she's see. alive at the end of this season, for sure. Um, oh. Yeah. Uh, well, but, in my head, it, 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 never mind. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the, we did get a, they, when they announced season two, they do, it's like a 20 second audio teaser and it's a, uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but it's basically Caitlin talking to Vi. And I think what she says is like, if I go after your sister alone, no matter which way I like slice it, one of us is coming back in a body bag. And then Vi agrees to go with her to find Jinx. So I think that will be at least part of what season two is. is okay, um, cool. Yeah. So basically, I because I, I, I think that there's still some good left within her somewhere that can be saved. But she goes very dark <laughs> at the end. <laughs> yeah, she goes she goes full blown terrorist at the end. Yes, that's, <laughs> which that, that's hard to redeem. <laughs> that was a beautiful sequence of shots too. That was yes. like a very visually stunning ending. At first, I thought she was blowing up the moon. That Me is too. what I thought was happening. <laughs> <laughs> the moon, you. <laughs> I was like, holy shit, she's gonna bring down the moon. But no, she did uh, not. Um, that would have been but, so funny. <laughs> but let's uh, let's divert a little bit and talk about two of our other main characters. Our our Piltover leads, uh, Jace and Victor, the um, the sci- science bros. And uh, so Jace is seems like he's from like a slightly lower noble house than some other ones, but he's in the academy. Victor is yeah. a staff member of the academy. And uh, they start experimenting with this Hextech stuff. And that launches them into superstardom 
um, or at least Jace, and then Victor kind of does behind the scenes stuff. Interesting guys, I think. There's a lot going on with these two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When they were first introduced, I was kind of like, I'm not interested in this. Don't show me this. I want to see more like Jinx and <laughs> Jinx and you know the other a vibe. But you know, as the story kind of progressed, I did mm-hmm. start to really get into it because it is very interesting. Um, they start out so well intentioned because they think you know with hex tech, this middle ground between science and magic. You know, mm-hmm. there is so much potential here with this technology. You could change the world in so many different ways. You could improve healthcare. You could you could you could do so many things. You could eliminate poverty. You could, mm-hmm. you could just eliminate so many different things and improve commerce and trade and just life all around the world with this, with this tiny little gemstone. Yeah. And it is quite interesting, not only to see like how their um, intentions start to kind of like become a little bit misguided and mm-hmm. become a little like, you know, diluted. Um, the path that they both take is different, you know, from each other, you know, Victor's kind of behind the scenes, Jace is more in the forefront and like how the corruption kind of festers underneath is, it's, it's very interesting to me. Yeah. Jace sort of the, the higher he rises in the society, the more it sort of starts to corrupt him a little bit. Like there's that great scene at the theater where he starts compromising and like cutting deals with all the other council members, because it's like, He's told, I think rightfully, that he he has to make deals to make the things he wants to do happen. But in doing so, he uh, he compromises his morals. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, he was really just it was interesting to watch him not like I don't think he gets quite corrupted by the end. I think he sort of realizes um, he has some awakening, but also he's just willing to like make a deal with Silco as well. <laughs> Like, yeah. Well, I think that, you know, one of the good things about Jace is that he does kind of subvert some expectations because he's not, not just blind. He doesn't just have the rafters, mm-hmm. like keeping his eyes focused on like the end goal or anything like that. Like he's aware of like th- the different layers of our society and like, you know, the underworld is this whole other beast. And, you know, he's, I think he's got some great intentions um like we said but you know i think he's also aware of the corruption and he does his best to kind of grapple with it and i think a good instance of that is like when at the at in the final arc when he's like joins vi Mm -hmm. kind of destroying silco's facility he accidentally kills a child in the crossfire yeah and that just kind of awakens him to like this was a wrong thing to do. Like he's like still kind of guided by that little streak of morality. Mm-hmm. And that in turn leads him to like, say, okay, this is not the way I need to seek a diplomatic solution. And I think that's like very mature of him. That's interesting. Cause I, I feel a little um, differently about his uh, trajectory mm. with that actually. I, and I think he and Caitlin sort of have opposite arcs in this way. I think, um, mm. Jace does realize the problem he is causing to the Undercity, but only when he kills that kid. And and Vi correctly calls him out. She's like, because he, he, he says, like, I'm a part of this now. And she's like, dude, you were always a part of this. You just are directly. So it's like he recognizes that he fucked up when he directly took action, but he isn't recognizing like the broader systemic elements of his role in society. Like, Mm. The higher ups of Piltover don't give a shit about the people in the Undercity and they forget them and neglect them. And that's what leads to Silco's type taking control and putting like people in these these mills or whatever. And I think I think where Jace Jace basically is like, oh, no, I have taken direct action that was bad. So now I need to broker a peace with the guy who is causing this or like the opportunist who has risen to power because of the things my buddies and I did up top. So it's like, he almost has a negative arc in that way where Caitlin, Mm. I think is sort of wakes up to the, the like systemic realities of the undercity more because she actually goes Mm -hmm. and participates in that part of society for a little bit. So that's why I think Jace's arc is super interesting. And uh, Heimerdinger sort of has the, a Caitlin esque arc as well. He, 
Um, yeah. He, he sort of has his exodus into that area and starts to see the reality of the city that he founded, um, which is interesting. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Cause yeah, I was, I think we did, did have some like conflicting mm-hmm. viewpoints there. And I mean, you know, to each their own. Um, but yeah, I think Jace is a very interesting character. And as he kind of goes on through the series in the, that final arc, you know, he is faced with this decision of like, should I use this hex tech that I, that we're creating to improve mm-hmm. lives all over the world? Should we use that to create weapons? And you know, that opens a whole can of worms on its own because yeah. it's like you're supposed to save lives, not take them. But if the Undercity's going to do it, then shouldn't we get ahead of it? And it's like mm-hmm. it's kind of Cold War arms race a little bit. Um, and I thought that was kind of just an interesting dilemma to be like faced um, at that point in the series, too, especially when he's become like the face of a generation and he's got such enormous power. He's mm-hmm. basically the king of Piltover, but yeah, he yeah, really takes the de facto <laughs> king. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. His, it, his hammer was sick too. <laughs> That's a cool. Yeah. That was weapon. kind of funny. Like all of a sudden it's like, Oh, you're, you know how to fight. What, where did this guy? <laughs> well, and he has the like little drawing of him with the hammer and the cape. It's like, what, what? Okay. <laughs> it's like really dude, really you think you're Thor or something? <laughs> yeah. I, I did love the, um, the contrast between him and Victor and Heimerdinger though, because like mm-hmm. Heimerdinger is almost like Jace's level of ignorance, but to a higher level because he's like, he's, um, he's just like, he's so long lived. He, he's like, Oh, we can take our time. We can research like in a couple decades, you'll be able to release this. And they're like, what the fuck, man, we don't live that long. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it's <laughs> like his, uh, his, old his, the longer lifespan sort of makes him not treat things that could help a lot of people with very much urgency. And uh, that really comes to fruition when Victor starts dying. And like Victor, Victor's time is very short. And uh, Heimerdinger mm-hmm. is not really that sensitive to that. Like, yeah, he just tells him it's like the brightest stars burn out the fastest or something like he's fucking Roy Batty. <laughs> yeah it's like oh yeah that makes me feel great dude thanks yeah uh, but, but yeah i think the the whole heimerdinger thing was very interesting you know because like you were saying he founded this city mm-hmm. it's his city you know and he's got such a profound influence over it and then as soon as he's removed from the council and he goes off and he tries to like help the under city on his own no one wants his help yeah no one wants his help they they treat him like less than dirt and they don't even care that he was used to be a council member they're like mm, fuck you but until like, he <laughs> until he finds echo and like goes to that little community and it seems yeah like, that was interesting yeah it seems like he has an epiphany there about what you know what life is really like because it's like he had and my my read on him and i don't know if you agree or not it's like he just treated the undercity with like a willful ignorance because it was like the dirty secret of the city of progress is the consequences of that progress and the consequences happen elsewhere. It's sort of like when we have awesome economic developments that benefit us here in the U S but it causes like, like horrible wages and environmental catastrophe, other places in the world. It's like that Mm -hmm. same type of relationship. (laughs) Yeah. Or it's like, Oh, I'm, you know, your clothes are being made overseas, but it's made in a sweatshop by like mm-hmm. slave labor or child labor. And then it comes to the US and you're like, oh, it was $40. I don't think I'm going to get it because it's yeah. like a little bit too much money that I want to spend today. Mm-hmm. Um, but then like when you do buy into it, you're like, oh, I'm just kind of supporting this cycle of poverty and depression. And right. um, yeah, I, 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 I agree. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's like when a brand does like a, a big PR campaign about how they support like LGBTQ rights in America while they have like child labor in Bangladesh <laughs> or something. It's like, it's like putting on a nice face for the people they care to impress, but um, like basically using slaves in other part of the world, like, like Nike, yeah. like Nike does that. <laughs> like Nike, <laughs> just do it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, to counterpoint this kind of stuff that we're talking okay. about, because this is all in- this is all interesting, and um, to me, I do understand where Heimerdinger's coming from a little bit with this mm-hmm. technology, 
Heimerdinger to me kind of feels like a true scientist because what science is, is you have a hypothesis, you go out and you test it. And if it, and then depending on the results of that experiment, you go back to the drawing board, you adjust your hypothesis and you change mm -hmm. some variables and you keep repeating that process until you make a, until you make a breakthrough. And that's kind of what I think Heimerdinger was nudging them towards, but I get what you're saying. Like, yes, yeah. decades is a little bit too long. You could research this for like two years and then maybe release it. it to the public. Exactly. It's he, he kind of reminded me of um, Yoda in the prequels a little bit. Mm. It's like, He's in some ways right, but also he's not sensitive to the feelings of his student. And because of that, like, he's not able to understand. It's like in episode three when Anakin goes to Yoda and he's clearly, like, traumatized because he's having dreams of his wife who's going to inexplicably die in childbirth. Yeah. <laughs> and Yoda's just like, yeah, man, you got to be okay with losing everything. It's like, that is not a helpful lesson in this context, Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Yoda. Read the yeah. room. <laughs> yeah, so Heimerdinger kind of reminded me of Yoda in that sense, where he's like, he's trying to be helpful, but he's not understanding the, the emotional context that his students are approaching the problem from. So he's unable to like meet them halfway. Sure, yeah. I, I totally get that interpretation. Um... I, th I had a note here where I was like, you know, because a Heimerdinger is like so focused on the science of it and like testing it, making sure mm -hmm. it's okay. He feels like a true scientist to me. Meanwhile, Jace, on the other hand, to me, feels a little bit more akin to Elon Musk, where he's like, <laughs> we got to go. We got to get this thing out in the market right now. We got to help yeah, people. You're, we you're right. Going. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I think Jace genuinely wants to help people a little bit more than Elon does. Yeah. But <laughs> totally. Absolutely. He does. <laughs> but um, yeah. And I, I think you're totally right. Heimerdinger is pure scientist. He's just like, operating on such a different timetable than people than other people because he lives so long and he's like we can wait we can afford to wait this long blah 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 but mm -hmm. that being said his, his when he is betrayed and voted off the council it is heartbreaking it's so sad and his little is, face like, his little no. face is so devastated <laughs> like don't do this to me what will i do <laughs> oh do you want to know what his species is called i learned this from team fight tactics they're called what yordles they're called yordles. <laughs> yordles. <laughs> They're so cute. <laughs> That's like, oh, I'm trying to think of like what that is a combination of because it's like, it's like, it feels like Yaddle from from like, <laughs> from Star Wars, like that other Yoda <laughs> from the prequels. <laughs> but it also feels like a Yorkie tied into something else. Like, <laughs> and he has a tiny dog too. He's a tiny little man. Oh, yeah! He has a tiny dog. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. That's so cute. Uh, but um, I mean, oh, also an interesting thing about Heimerdinger, he's terrified of magic. I'm very interested mm -hmm. to know why. What happened? In like, were the Yordles like? persecuted by mages or something like that like what's going on in that backstory because jace is obsessed with this stuff because he was he and his mom were like rescued by a mage from a blizzard or something which i'm sure yeah. we'll get more information on in a season two or three maybe but um yeah what the fuck happened why is why is heimerdinger so afraid of magic and why is magic not a part of piltover that's um a good mystery for later <laughs> Yeah, very interested to see more on that. Um, but while before we move on to someone else, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think we need to talk about Victor as well Victor. because you can't talk about yeah, you can't talk about Jace without talking about Victor because they are no. the Hextech Bros. Yeah. Um, and you know, when Victor was first introduced to the series, I definitely kind of thought he was like a little snake. Or something like that. Like mm, he was going to stab okay. Jason in the back and kind of steal the technology or something like that. But that was just kind of like, you know, I think his, he always, always kind of presented in this darker light. Like, mm -hmm. you know, he's a, also, um, uh, you know, he's got some uh, ge genetic deformities. Um, so I think, you know, that kind of bleeds into my um, perception sometimes. But, you know, Victor turns out to be just as obsessed with, you know, helping others as mm -hmm. Jace is. And he wants to contribute to Hextech and contribute to improving lives. Yeah. Um, he's a purely it, loyal friend. <laughs> yeah. He's a great dude, like through and through. Um, but it is also interesting how his obsession with improving lives becomes corrupted as well. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because he he gets desperate. He has his he gets like des- yeah. He gets a ticking clock, and what he has probably like a couple months, I think. Right, is what they say. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they don't they don't say how long. They're just okay. like oh. It's bad. <laughs> you're gonna die because yeah. you're in the hospital. <laughs> um, and one one uh, element I didn't pick up on myself, but I saw mentioned somewhere is in between the time jump, he goes from having a cane to having a full crutch. So just like visually showing us his um his physical degradation seems mean, but he, his his condition is getting worse. Whatever he has yes. is getting worse, and it's a result of him growing up in the undercity. I believe, right? Mm-hmm. That's uh, yeah. It. I think it does have some. Yeah, it is kind of because of the undercity, but I think it is also like he's always kind of had that limp. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's never fully explained. I don't really need him to explain it, but yeah, that is interesting. I didn't really pick up on that, so thank you for nice pointing little, that out. <laughs> nice little visual storytelling. There is a lot of it here. Um, it is. It is such a detailed series. Like I can understand why it took them six fucking years. I know. To create all of this this is incredible yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh victor's um path to destruction is very sad his poor lab assistant like <laughs> yeah that poor girl she's yeah because victor falls down this path of you know the hex cube or what is it called is that what it's called i can't remember i think it's called the hex cube yeah something like that but it, you know he's like he's like we're thinking about this all wrong, you know, because we got to integrate runes into it. And like, you know, magic is, you know, it's not just about like you're pressing this button. It's like you're really actually like trying to manipulate mm-hmm. um, and use these combinations of runes and stuff. And, you know, in that obsession of like trying to perfect that and, you know, he wants to heal his own body and yeah. he wants to be able to live long enough to see, you know, his technology take off with Jace and continue to contribute to the world. Mm-hmm. And in the process of trying to crack that hex cube and heal his body, he absorbs and he kills. vaporizes his lab assistant who loves him and is excited <laughs> to like show him something. <laughs> yeah, it really felt like sh- not to say that like you know we all have one chance at true happiness, but like. <laughs> she would have been happy if he if he like lived out the rest of his days with that woman i'm sure he would have been fine but yeah. <laughs> that's very heartbreaking yeah it was like very shocking when that happened um mm-hmm. it's also kind of shocking that her disappearance is not mentioned again throughout the rest yeah. of this scene <laughs> i feel kind no of one bad notices um <laughs> One, he just dumps one, out the ashes and that's it yeah like, <laughs> he like yeah um one one element of victor's story that I think needed a little bit more time was the um, his like relationship with that older chemist guy and the mutant creature. Mm. I, I wanted a little bit more to see what that was all about. It didn't really add up to anything for me, at least not yet. I thought it was kind of strange. Um, how did you feel about that? Yeah, I understand that. I think, cause I was kind of, it was introduced very late in the series. Mm-hmm. Um, But I also think it does kind of have some parallel to um, the hex cube that Victor creates because, Mm -hmm. you know, the chemist guy, he's all focused on keeping the mutation alive. It doesn't matter if the creature suffers. I'm just trying to keep this mutation alive. Um, And then you see Victor creating this hex cube and he puts more into it and he puts his own blood into it. Mm -hmm. And then he like injects himself with that thing. And then it absorbs that woman and then at the end, you know, when he's like trying to destroy it, he just doesn't have the willpower to destroy uh-huh. it. So he drops the chair, but the cube kind of gives him like a little shock, like yeah. into the parts of him that he modified. Mm-hmm. So it seems like the cube has become sentient life. And yeah. I like see that. this kind of Frankenstein-esque parallel, at least to a certain degree, between Victor and his obsession with the cube to the chemist and the mutation. Okay. A little bit there. Um, cool. Not, not, not shot for shot or anything like that, you know, but I think there is a little bit of a parallel there. Um, but I think that is very interesting how he creates this kind of form of sentient life. And I'm very mm-hmm. interested to see what they're going to do with it in season two, because I'm assuming that thing wasn't destroyed. In yeah. Jinx's he, he does <laughs> ask, he does ask Jace to destroy it because he can't, but they don't get to that. Um, mm-hmm. so. But uh yeah. Yeah, and I, I really love Victor's line to Jace. Um, and it really summarizes their whole story. It's like, 
in the pursuit of great, we forgot to do good. Like they, they lost sight of why they were doing what they were doing. Um, and and Mm -hmm. probably because they didn't, well, a Victor does more than Jace, but Jace doesn't have the full context of society and why things are broken. Um, and he still doesn't by the end. Uh, but you know, maybe they'll figure it out. (laughs) Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I think that's such a great line. Unless Um, they died. (laughs) Yeah, I hope I, that they didn't. <laughs> I, I don't think they did. And there there have been on my rewatch a little while ago, because it was pointed out to me after I watched the series, like right before the explosion, like Mel's shoulders kind of start glowing and people think she has like a force field ability or something that protects them from the mm. rocket. So that might be how they survive. Because there's no way they were going to kill off those two characters. Oh, no. Like... I mean, I really, we'll talk about the ending a little mm-hmm. bit later, I think, but yeah. I, yeah, the ending was beautiful. And like, honestly, I'm glad we're getting a second season, but that ending, I would have been fine with that just being the end of the oh, series. Oh, really? <laughs> it's so no, upsetting, well, a, part, a part of me kind of would. It's like, I'm not saying I wanted that to be the ending. I'm just no. kind of saying like, oh, that was kind of like, if that was the end of it, like, that's very thought provoking. Like, like yeah. everyone's dead, but yeah whatever yeah um catchy theme song i like the imagine dragon song <laughs> they have, they do a lot it. of they do a lot of music throughout the show actually they're the band is in yeah. the show actually they're, they're animated versions of the band that one of the characters walks past in the undercity yeah i wish when they saw the band in the undercity they were playing a different song because mm. every time i heard that song i was like come on let's just <laughs> i don't need to keep hearing this song over and over again yeah um but that's I think Woodkin me. had a song in it too. Didn't they? Oh, really? I love Woodkid. Arcane Woodkin. I think um, in the scene where uh, Jinx fires up the flare, that's Woodkin. Oh. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> but, I mean, uh, they do make some good music, Imagine Dragons. Mm-hmm. I remember... <laughs> We're gonna go on. I'm gonna go on a little tangent here about Imagine okay. Dragons because I do appreciate their music. In high school, I shit you not, I was one of the fucking first hipsters for Imagine Dragons. <laughs> I am. I found that radioactive song when there was probably like four thousand views on it or something That's like hilarious. that. Like ten thousand. Yeah, views. I think you've told me this. I <laughs> and I just loved it. I played it to death. And then fast forward one week later, everyone's playing it. It's everyone on the radio, and I'm like motherfucker i heard it first <laughs> yeah though no, they did that song did get overplayed to shit i heard it on the radio like six yes. times a day i <laughs> so fair yeah but i did like the enemy song that the the mm-hmm. main theme song is and um but i mean that is what i think one valid thing to point out is like if you really fucking hate imagine dragons it might be frustrating when a really good scene is happening and an imagine dragon song comes on <laughs> Yeah, you're like ah <laughs> it, it it is funny that imagine dragons is the theme music of this and then in Haley steinfeld's other project that was going out at the same time hawkeye she like shits on imagine dragons <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that's right <laughs> um but parallels yeah speaking of Haley steinfeld let's talk about vi and caitlin um yeah yeah uh typical opposite sides of the tracks romance but it works. And I think it's a pretty organic relationship. I, I think agree. it's really good. <laughs> well, I, you know, there's always that that is kind of like an overplayed trope of like, yeah, she's from this world and he's from that world. And mm-hmm. now they're, now they're more romantically interested or like they're linked. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of overplayed, but I do think it works really well here. Um, they're not just like, rushing to the finish line of being like yes they're in a relationship there or there is some romance there it's like yeah it's slowly building very and slow do like they're not that. even fully there by the end of the season the season oh, yeah like they their feelings are known to each other but they're not in a relationship yet but um i i do love that the when they're in like the whorehouse and uh vi is just like pick one like man or woman and then she sees Caitlin with the girl and like the look on her face is like fuck yeah (laughs) (laughs) just rewatch that scene she just like has a stupidly wide smile on her face yes (laughs) 
get after a girl yes <laughs> well no because she's like she's like oh good she's into women i have a shot this is awesome <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> it was pretty funny um but their relationship i, I think that. yeah their their relationship is uh really well done um and you, you get to see Caitlyn grow sort of wiser to the workings of society throughout the season I mentioned it earlier when we, i was comparing her to jace but it's like she gets immersed in the culture of the undercity and sees the pain through Vi that living there like causes. So she ends the season like with a broader systemic understanding of like how she's been complicit in it and she wants to do better. I I like Mm -hmm. her arc a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, that, that is kind of interesting what you were saying before about her being the opposite of Jace because Mm -hmm. they start out in the same spot you know they're Mm -hmm. both walking to his apartment and they obviously know each other and they're like friends growing up or whatever like there is some relationship there um you know it's amicable Mm -hmm. uh clearly and you know i think that is worth noting how their paths are so different she follows the enforcer path and trying to be a good cop yeah. Um, and then you have Jace over there who gets more involved in politics and technology and he's making these big strides and then he in his attempts to kind of root out the corruption he becomes complicit in the corruption to, yeah. to a certain mm-hmm. degree um, and he, de- he develops his own form of corruption too I would say um, right and, and where Caitlin is sort of more resistant to the corruption like she joins the police force out of a pure motivation, but the police force is of course corrupt and similar to how police work in our world. They kind of like live in the nicer neighborhood then they march down into the less nice part of town and kind of fuck shit up and kill people and then leave. Um, And she sort of starts to see the error of those ways um, at least a little Mm -hmm. bit. Uh, And her idealism is broken a little bit, but she's more responsible by the end, I think. Yeah, yeah. And I do appreciate like how, yeah, I just appreciate that relationship. And I'm excited to see where that that goes organically from here, especially Mm -hmm. since it sounds like from what you told me about season two, they're just going to be like buddy cops, um, kind of (laughs) Mm -hmm. chasing after powder slash jinx. So, um, right. Well, and the, the complicating factor for their relationship is Jinx because Caitlin is looking for her because she uh, murdered a lot of people and Vi sort of keeps it on the down low that Jinx is her sister and it doesn't like cause a of like fatal shift in their growing relationship when Caitlin finds that out, but it is like a good dramatic crescendo for act two when uh, the three of them meet and that's sort of like, I don't know. Everybody's kind of fucked up by that. Like Jinx is um, had been told by someone that like Vi is with a cop looking for her. And that sort of gets falsely confirmed for her by that meeting. And then Caitlin is like, what the hell? She's your sister. She killed a lot of people. And then uh, and then Echo and his buddies on their flying skateboards attack. (laughs) Yeah, it's yeah. I do appreciate how that grows. And um you know, Vi as a protagonist too, I think she's, I, you have a note here about it as well, um, that she's just, she's just such a great protagonist. Um, like she's just such a good person to kind of follow throughout the story and, you know, to watch her relationship with Caitlin and also with her sister and all these other characters grow and develop is a intensely interesting, um, mm-hmm. especially since she kind of as the series goes on, I feel like she does listen to Vander's wisdom a little bit of she knows when to throw a punch and she knows when to not throw a punch a little bit. She knows when to put the glove on and when to say, okay, let's, let's, let's take a step back or Mm -hmm. something like that, you know? Yeah. Um, But yeah. Yeah. The, uh, she's getting there. (laughs) She's still like, yes, she's yes, absolutely. Yeah. Like I was, when she teams up with Jace, I found her, her like pursuit of that a little bit misguided. Um, but also her fight against uh, the lady with the mechanical arm, whose name I'm forgetting, in the yes. b- in the bar is awesome. <laughs> that rematch, it's, oh, it's such beautiful. a brutal fight. Um, but yeah, and and Vi is an interesting protagonist because you you can really see like so much weight is put on her shoulders that she, as like especially in Act One, like as a teenager, should not be having to deal with. Like saw her parents die, she's taking. Re- 
trying to take care of her younger sister and the other kids. And they're all looking up to her for leadership. And then they all die in front of her. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so it's kind of like she almost feels like she's not doing a good enough job and she feels responsible for her sister's descent because she kind of is partially responsible for that. Um, but it's complicated. Uh, yeah, it's complicated, but it is really sad at the at the end when they're at that table, the dinner table, and mm-hmm. she's just trying to reason with her, but it's kind of too late because Jinx is like all shimmered up too at that point. Probably does not mm-hmm. help the situation. Um, but yeah, yeah I, I'm Jinx. excited. I'm excited to see that relationship continue as well. There's a lot going yes. on there. Yeah. Uh, Welcome to Play Pause Rewind, the uh, the Haley Steinfeld fan club hour. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we love her. She's great. Um, She's great. And you know, while we're talking about uh, Vi and Caitlin, uh, why don't we move on to one of the other characters that I think is really profound in this series, which is Silco. Yes, um, Silco. I think he's just such a great villain um very effective dark and creepy Mm -hmm. methodical and calculating but then there's also this other side to him that's very touching and it's you know it's that kind of relationship that he has with jinx um Mm -hmm. i there was a part of me that kind of felt like it felt a little like Eh, like a little inappropriate like just i agree age. i very yes. much agree i was really bothered by the scene where she's <laughs> sitting on his lap and doing the thing i'm like i guess i was like is this a father-daughter thing or is it like mm-hmm. a pedo sex thing what the fuck is going on i did not like that at all i wish they hadn't done that why i it because it, it really like it weighed on my mind when they're having their like father-daughter dynamic later on i'm like why was there creepy sex tension in that scene? I didn't like yeah. that. <laughs> it was kind of like, oh, yeah. There was moments like that that were kind of weird. Um, they can't have intended I- it that way based on the way the season goes, right? Like, that, I, I think it was an unintentional thing. It might have been. It also might have just been like, you know, Jinx clearly has... Um, a serious need for therapy in general mm-hmm. um yeah her entire family either has been slaughtered before her eyes or abandoned her mm-hmm. um so you know i think she's getting a lot of mixed signals from the world um and there's probably some mixed signals coming from like her father figure silco a little bit too for her but hashtag therapy for jinx yes please please (laughs) yeah therapy for jinx well and that's a great point you make too because like had vander not died he probably would have helped guide her through her troubles or something like that but Mm -hmm. instead she lands in the care of silco who is not really interested in that (laughs) Mm -hmm. because he he does have a love for her but he's also willing to use her for his own ends but not fully yeah he he does choose her over zon yes that is a very like touching thing at the end because you know he's offered this truce this idea of peace Mm -hmm. uh from chase Chase. yeah you know they have this deal um and he's lays out all these conditions he's like that's it that's all you want he's like and you have to give me jinx and she's like Mm -hmm. what no like i can't i can never part with her like it's clear that he had such a like strong emotional connection with Jinx and like the fact that he would give up his entire dream of a separate city state or nation or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. like for her is, you know, I think that's very touching. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with his choice to reanimate her with shimmer, um, but whatever. (laughs) Yeah. I, I do think the the scene where he decides it's her over Zahn was really uh, actually touching, though, because he goes to Vander's statue and yeah. it, he's like realizing in that moment, it's like, oh, that's why Vander abandoned the cause. He chose the kids. He wanted to mm-hmm. keep them safe and he valued that more than the revolution. And he finally like has that realization 
it's just too late and jinx overhears him and misunderstands him and and murders him <laughs> yeah <laughs> but also like he was gonna murder vi so it was like one of the two <laughs> so mm-hmm. yeah uh, it's it's okay and yeah he was a good effective villain for the season mm-hmm. um but yeah moving forward in the second season i'm interested to see who's gonna be the next big baddie <laughs> yeah um yeah, and he was such a great villain. And he, it, the like a lot of great villains, I think he's right. Like a freeze on would probably be good because they wouldn't be under the same jurisdiction as Piltover that doesn't give a shit about them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it does kind of create an interesting dynamic between the two cities. And then it also, I feel like I just kind of thought of this off the top of my head now. You know, if Zon became its own city, mm-hmm. let's just say that happened. Would then would an undercity develop under Zon, and then would another undercity develop under Piltover? And yeah. you have like, is it is this like a compounding problem? I don't necessarily think so, but like I feel like there there is maybe some conversation about that mm-hmm. um, because I feel like in a society, you know, there's it's it's difficult to create such um, a fair balance between like the rich and the poor, the upper class and the lower class. Like there's a reason why there's upper and lower. It's because it's really hard to treat everyone equitably and fairly and, you know, without privilege. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, just a thought. (laughs) Which is why the workers should own the means of production. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Um, Yeah, Marxism. Uh, But I mean, I I think (laughs) if if nothing, I mean, seriously though, like if nothing had changed, uh, yeah, it would, because that's what a hierarchical system does. It enforces itself, and it ultimately mm-hmm. creates the haves and the have-nots on the extreme. So if if Zahn had become independent under Silco's rule, you would have had the mob boss cartels, and then you would have had their underlings, and there would have just been a hierarchy under a different leader. So you're, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's the power is ours really to to shape our own destinies and you know i'm not saying we need to pull up our bootstrap pull pull ourselves up by our bootstraps which is kind of impossible uh, to begin with because your boots are already on um but um <laughs> well that's you know, the funny thing that's the funny thing about that phrase right it was yeah the, the person who said it was a marxist and he was mocking the the notion of capitalism and yeah. then people started to take it seriously and will I, un, I will unironically tell poor people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps <laughs> but like, shut up yeah. um but, but you know I, like that's what the show's about in a lot of ways is like classism and uh systemic problems like the yeah the people up the, at the top are so caught up in their city of progress that they forgot about the people in their actual city yeah, and, they forgot about the people they're leaving behind. And, you know, there is like, I feel like Piltover does give off this idea of being a utopia. Mm-hmm. Um, and a utopia just can't exist. Um, it's just impossible to achieve. Uh, but, you know, we can work hard to create a better society and all that stuff. So I think, you know, there is a debate. You, 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 could, you could make an argument that, you know, yes, if Zahn was created, and the, mm-hmm. there's two di- separate city states. Maybe there would be an undercity, but if you worked really hard at it and tried your darndest, maybe just maybe you could have a fair society. But yeah, I think improving little... the conditions. And yeah. and I mean that's that's what Vi is talking about with Jace. It's like the undercity exists because people like Jace willfully looked the other way in regards to the undercity, which allowed for people like Silco to take control. And like in the mm-hmm. desperation of the poor people, like they turned to someone like Silco because they had no other choice. Whereas if the people of Piltover had given a shit and like understood the consequences of their actions, Silco wouldn't have had a way to rise to power. Like that's how it always happens, right? Mm-hmm. The people yeah. with the power to do good don't. And then so an evil or darker opportunist will rise up and offer an alternative to the less fortunate. Mm-hmm. Happens all the time. <laughs> Fucking nuts. <laughs> On a more fun note, the Echo versus Jinx fight is fucking sick. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Oh, it's 
one of the best sequences of the show. Like, I yeah. think a lot of this action sequences, like we were talking about with the rematch between Vi and the lady with the arm, mm-hmm. whose name we're forgetting, that was amazing as well but the echo versus jinx fight i think is definitely like one of my favorites for yeah. sure it really pushes the envelope of the show's animation style i love that it like my my read on it is the when it shows them as little kids it's just like like they've they've done this before when they were growing up yes um so it was like sort of a the innocence of them as kids versus them now as adults and the different people they are it was really cool awesome stuff well, yeah, it's like you guys grew up together and you used to play fight, and then now it's the real thing. Like it's mm-hmm. just, it's 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 breathtaking. Um, yep. Just can't say that word enough on this podcast. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> um, but, but speaking yeah, of moving, breathtaking, yes, the, en- the ending, <laughs> the ending. Ah, uh, the ending is magnificent. So, mm-hmm. um, just to recap, what the ending was. Um, Jinx basically kidnaps Caitlyn, um, Vi, and Silco and ties them up in chairs around this table. And then, you know, she's kind of got some other elements there mm-hmm. of like her warped childhood um, with the friends that she killed, like as stuffed animals and stuff like that. She ultimately, you know, she's grappling with her own mental illness in this scene. She ultimately kills Silco um, and then uses the hex tech technology that she created to nuke uh the or at least just bomb the yeah. uh piltover you know the, the council high council, chamber yeah the, the council chamber she aims right at it or the moon and she misses <laughs> no she aims for that she aims for the council not the moon and uh that's where this that's where this the yeah. season ends you know as, as the council is unanimously voting for peace and a freeze on at the expense yes. of of uh, jinx's capture but yeah, that that scene at the dinner table is so tense because she's at this point, her behavior is so unpredictable. You don't know what's going to happen. Like she could just pop off at any second and kill Caitlin, um, which would have been very sad. Or yes. and you, you also see Silco like starting to get loose a little bit. So it's just like perfect tension. It's great. <laughs> yeah, it, they, they built the tension really well. And, you know, I this I really like the song that they included here at the end that that Imagine Dragon song. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was. A, the perfect choice for that because it really does leave us with a, a a few different interpretations i think for like a message from the show or like things that you can pull away from it my uh-huh. initial interpretation was like you know kind of basing it off of league of legends off of video games with that song i think it's like as the nuke is hitting it's like i think the words of the song are like what could have been you mm-hmm. know and you have this whole situation where they're voting for peace right at the moment when they're getting bombed. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, well, anything could have been possible. There's like any future, so many things could have been accomplished and created, but instead Jinx fucking kills everyone with this mm-hmm. bomb. So when I kind of first finished it through the video game lens, I was kind of like, oh, it's like kind of a, reflecting on how video games are an exploration of creative expression anything's possible the future's you know anything could happen Mm -hmm. um but i think you know it doesn't have to just be necessarily video games it could just be life in general um right and and like jinx is taking this incredibly violent action but if she had had a better support system around her when she was younger she wouldn't be in mm -hmm. the situation to begin with so it's like she's such an interesting character because she does objectively horrible things, but you feel bad for her at the same time, because you can see like she has an immense amount of trauma and a mental illness and no one to help her with it at all. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and, and she's encouraged to be violent by her father figure. Like she's, she's pushed to this level and she's distrustful. And, um, and I mean, Vi is, like that in a lot of ways too she's more in control of herself than jinx is but she has similar trauma and probably recognizes the role she played in her sister's downfall um Mm -hmm. and it's like i don't know it's a really poignant and sad ending because it's like yeah because jinx i think up until this point was like there's a little bit of a chance she could could turn a corner but now she's gone in too deep like she's She's in the territory of villainy now, I think. She has been radicalized and <laughs> she is now a legitimate terrorist, I would argue. Um, 
because she literally bombed the the place of government. Um, so it is a very impactful ending. And you know, kind of to your point too, I mm-hmm. think there's something here about like you know nature versus nurture. If she had that support system, if she had like you know a good father figure mm-hmm. and all this other stuff, would Powder have always evolved into this jinx like character and you know yeah. committed these horrible acts like how much of that influence was silco how much of that was vi like how much of that was just the fact that she grew up in the underworld like if she grew up in you know the upper class of mm-hmm. piltover there's no way she would have ever been this violent like she would have had access to health care she's like all this other stuff like it's just yeah. like she I would think- have been taken care of because that's mm-hmm. what because on that side of the bridge, people are taken care of. People are very wealthy and they have everything they need. It's the city of progress and science. Yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I think, you know, you like, as we've talked about several times throughout this episode, mm-hmm. there's also a message that you can pull out here from the end of like class struggle and socioeconomic challenges as well. Those in the underworld of Zahn have been repeatedly slaughtered denied the rights and freedoms of piltover citizens time and time again they're just kind of glossed over as an afterthought no one's thinking of them the council isn't thinking of them and then when the council is making this act to finally remedy the situation Mm -hmm. it's far too late um to change it and it's it's this i think just that whole class dynamic is just fascinating throughout the series Um, yeah you know, well, it's like the people the people in charge just don't care about the lives of yeah, the people right. in the world. And, yeah. and I think it's even further than that. I think the, the council isn't solving the problem of the undercity. They're washing their hands of it. They're saying mm-hmm. it should be an independent entity under Silco's control. Like what the fuck? Silco's already in control and it's a shithole. Like they're yeah, it's they're like- just they're just disengaging. They're like, we will be our, our city of progress and it, they can be their city of shit. Like it's, it's like um it's like br- the the end of British colonial rule over the all over the world. You know, mm-hmm. they're like, we're done. You guys figure it out. Bye. And they yeah. just leave. And then we have a situation like Israel and Palestine over there. Like <laughs> that is because of British colonization. God damn it. <laughs> well, I mean, that's yes, but also that's because we just like put people there after World War II when it was already yeah, land I, that I, was owned I, by people. <laughs> I'm simplifying um, it a lot, but you know, yeah. there's like, I feel like there's a lot of instances that are all over the world with like colonialism and then we leave and then the people in that country who should yeah. have been ruling themselves to begin with are in a worse off position because now they have to figure it out from scratch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, that is like, that's what we do as America too. We march into somewhere halfway across the world to fight our war and then we leave the place in, in blood and chaos every time. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's so ridiculous yeah but um, um israel's the apartheid state it's official now so yeah it is it stop is do, stop doing apartheid <laughs> yes seriously <laughs> um uh I mean, it, yeah that's a it's still a very <laughs> controversial take in the united states of america but it's true um but it yeah the, the the council is washing their hands of of uh zon and um it's it's sad, and some of them are probably going to be blown up next season, but I'm sure Jace, Victor, and Mel will survive because that would be kind of shocking if they didn't, I think. Yeah, I'm sure that they'll be fine. Um, absolutely. And I think, you know, this ending, it also kind of speaks to the idea of technology in general. Mm-hmm. Like technological revolutions and advances, they can do two things at the end of the day they can make us better or they can destroy us there's yep. like not really much in between um you know and hex you know the hex gates you know they improved trade and commerce they created opportunity for everyone but mm-hmm. at the same time those same hex gates were harming the people of the underworld it was creating hardships for them and you know they couldn't do their shimmer trade as efficiently or you know they weren't as heavily relied upon by others because the hex gates existed and that definitely created an even like bigger divide between the upper and the lower class. Well, I think the I think it's also that hex tech wasn't made available to the lower classes. So they turned yeah. they turned to shimmer to do the things that hex tech allowed the rich people to do. 
but the shimmer has like that really negative effect on your body. Like it has all the people in the tents and stuff who are just like shimmer addicts and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it increases strength, just like Jace's big gauntlets do or Vi's gauntlets now. Cause she just takes them, which is hilarious. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's like, so she gets to use those big gloves and there's no physical consequence for that. But like the, the kid in the first act who <laughs> gets the shimmer just dies. <laughs> yeah. He gets really fucked. Yeah, uh, it's an access access to opportunity, access to technology. Like things would have been very different if yeah he could have mass distributed that hex tech and distributed it to mm -hmm. Zon, which is what he places. wanted to do. Um, yes. Also, though, I I call bullshit that those were not engineered with weaponry in mind. Like hundred percent, you don't make <laughs> stuff like that unless you're like he's like you could lift rocks with these gloves. Like sure, sure, man. <laughs> yeah that's that's that, that's why you created them so you can mm -hmm. lift yeah totally <laughs> yeah but um anything and else? you know i yeah i'm just kind of circling back to the wire again because mm -hmm. you know the shimmer just kind of going back to that i feel like you know it that drug and the technology you know it had such influences on the behaviors of everyone you know everyone wanted the technology everyone wanted the shimmer because it made them better it made them stronger gave them advantages and opportunities and then that the the drug trade and then the technology just mm -hmm. had ripple effects across yeah. all the systems you know mm -hmm. the traffickers the enforcers the bandits like everyone is just trying to get their piece of the pie um same as the wire <laughs> with the heroin trade it mm -hmm. is ridiculous <laughs> yeah um but yeah at the end of the day what a great season um what a great so good. show um cannot wait for the next season hopefully it doesn't take six years they anyway. it's they said it wouldn't they said it wouldn't yeah. um good but that it's not going to be 2022 so it'll probably be late 2023 when we get it which is fine can wait <laughs> <laughs> that gives me time to rewatch it and yeah yeah build up the hype some more <laughs> yeah i'm i'm glad i rewatched it because i watched it a couple months ago whenever it came out but on that note high recommend for arcane i think it's beautiful yes. it's wonderful in every way but let's transition and we'll do a quick other stuff segment talk about the other stuff we have been consuming in the last few weeks niles let's start with you Oh man, uh, Arcane. I've been watching <laughs> Arcane. <laughs> um, besides that, um, you know, I've been watching little odds and ends of things like the newest season of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Got through that season 15. Mm -hmm. Pretty good, actually. I was very surprised at the quality of the season. Nice. Um, because I feel like they're starting to run out of ideas, but this this season didn't didn't necessarily feel like that. So I was happy about that. Um, and then I've been slowly watching my way through Peacemaker. I'm not fully caught up, but that show has been phenomenal. Oh, it's so um, good. <laughs> it's so funny. It's crude. It's outlandish. It's absurd. Like it's everything that we need right now from DC in order for that franchise to stay relevant and interesting, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, it's it's wild. Like I, I've been watching Peacemaker as well, and I agree. And like James Gunn across Marvel and DC has made consistently like some of the best shit in the superhero genre i mean mm -hmm. the two guardians movies the suicide yeah. squad and now peacemaker i mean good good god he doesn't miss I, I don't think it's such a good show um and that opening sequence is just so funny the oh the, the, the dance number it's great <laughs> yeah no you got to catch up it's it's really exciting apparently so the last two episodes like seven and eight which are coming up are like insane <laughs> Excellent. Oh, I didn't realize that it was that many. I thought it was going to be yeah, like it's gonna be seven eight. episodes or something. Yeah, there um, there's six out so far and there are two left. Um, nice. Uh, but yeah, that's about it for me lately. I've just been so busy. Yeah. Um, so what about you, Dylan? Uh, I finished Cyberpunk. It was great. I, uh, got nice. a, I, I got a really good ending to the game that I think was really fitting. Um, I, I think all in all, my playthrough was like 62 hours or something like that. Um, really good game uh it's still a little buggy if it's um if you're playing it on xbox one or ps4 i i've been told still stay far away it's broken as fuck <laughs> but uh the pc version's great so i finished that 
I also um, on Game Pass got Age of Empires 4 and have played like 20 minutes of that. But I love Age of Empires. Age of Empires 2 was one of my like first video Always games love ever. Um, Classic. And, uh, yeah. Last night, I started Cowboy Bebop and watched first two episodes, the, the cartoon, not the live action. Good. It's yeah. so fun. It's I great. I like it a lot so far. Um, it's really cool. But yeah, uh, still very early on in that. Peacemaker talked about also watch that. Uh, I watched the first set of episodes of the Critical Role D and D animated series adaptation on Amazon Prime called The Legend of Vox Machina. Um, it's fun. Interesting. It's the same voice cast from the actual Critical Role because they're all voice actors. That's the whole thing. It, it's a D and D game by voice actors. And okay, um, yeah, it's like the highest um paid program on twitch ever <laughs> it's it's enormous um it's actually cool. really cool the critical role is the show vox machina i'm not totally sold on yet uh and then also I'm still watching boba fett and it's oh yeah i need to catch up on that <laughs> it's fucking weird man <laughs> i heard um, it kind of turned a little bit into power rangers <laughs> no um, I think what you're hearing is like the, the biker gang from episode three, people said those power Rangers. Um, that's probably what it was. Yeah. I, they're just young people with cybernetics, like, and people got unreasonably upset about them. I actually like that idea. What's hilarious about the show though. And this is a slight spoiler, but the last two episodes of the book of Boba Fett have really not featured Boba Fett. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's it's, weird. Um, there's uh, uh yeah it's just briefly I'm you don't gonna, need to spoil it yeah, yeah you don't need to spoil yeah it. i, I want to spoil it but i'm like we have seen some interesting things in the last two episodes with some interesting characters but if you want to do a show about boba fett do a show about boba fett do not mm -hmm. do like if you want or and if you want to do what they have done this season just make a show and call it star wars and you can go from character to character between episodes, but this is fucking nonsense. I, I'm going to, I think I'm going to make a video about it on my channel. Like when the show is done, because I'm like the season finale is Wednesday and Boba Fett has had like a minute of screen time in the last two episodes. Wow. And, and we don't have a villain yet of a single villain. We have an organization. We don't have a person. So I'm like, the fuck are you doing? Hmm. <laughs> Okay, that's a little weird. It's weird. I, I only... like, you should watch it and catch up, and then we can talk about it more because it is, uh, like, despite the interesting nature of some of the stuff we've seen from a from a structure standpoint, horribly written show. Like, <laughs> I mean, what the hell? It, like, you, yeah, the half of the back half of this season has not featured the main character. Like, that's just amateur. And that is it's, so it's, weird. It's John Favreau and Dave Filoni. It's like y'all are better than this. What are you doing? I, I don't get it. <laughs> it That's, yeah, I only watched the first episode, and I was like, I'm not entirely sold on this. Like the this first is episode okay. is boring as fuck. I like <laughs> it is pretty boring. Like I appreciate getting some more context on the Tuscan Raiders, but at the same time, mm -hmm. I'm like, can we move away from Tatooine, please? I'm yeah. so tired of this planet. Yeah, and and the Tuscan Raider stuff gets better. Like that is the, okay, good. That is the coolest part of the show. Um. But, but I'm like, I, I feel about, or I felt about Boba Fett going into it the same way I felt about Solo, which was, why are you making this? This character fulfilled their function in the story already. Like Han's story was very complete. From A New mm -hmm. Hope to Force Awakens, like we got everything we needed to know about him. But Solo is a very fun movie. It won me over because it had the balls yeah. to just be its own thing and have its own characters and make me care about them. Boba Fett was almost there. You know, it was, I was starting to get a little interested and then we left the story behind for two episodes. <laughs> uh, I it's insanity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to catch up and we can, talk all about it um and then i can't wait to watch your video as mm -hmm. well whenever you post I'm, that on your youtube channel um that'll be very nice to watch 
Um, I'm, I'm very excited for the Obi-Wan show where we, uh, me too. where we follow boss Nass on his adventures. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> More Obi-Wan. We, we see Obi-Wan in the introductory sequence and then we cut to Naboo and we follow boss Nass who is inexplicably mm. still alive. <laughs> the most, the most beloved character in star Wars history. <laughs> <laughs> all right um and that, that's fuck that's, that's a good place two, to end it that's two boba fett rants from me in two episodes i have to stop i have to stop yeah um we'll, we'll talk about that another time <laughs> yes uh but until next time uh, and we need to figure out what our next episode is going to be on we'll do that later um <laughs> where can people find you online niles People can find me online on Instagram at Niles Got No Styles. Uh, Dylan, where can people follow you and watch that uh, upcoming Boba Fett? Yes. Um, <laughs> on Twitter at D Day Movies, on Instagram at Dylan D1026, on YouTube at D Day Movies. Uh, find that through the Instagram or Twitter, though. I got, I got myself buried by World War II footage because, uh, <laughs> you know, D Day. Um, and then on Twitch at D Day underscore movies. And that's it, I think. Yeah, that's well, all great. Of um, and yeah. I am I'm waiting for the Boba Fett finale to see if uh, any of the the bullshit they did in the last two weeks actually ties into the story or not. And then I'm gonna write that video and try to get it out soon. It is not what I planned on doing next, but I think there's an interesting subject to be had or to be discussed. Absolutely. So well, cool. Yeah. Thank you all so much for listening. You know, we mm-hmm. appreciate everyone who listens to these episodes. If you like what you're hearing on Play, Pause, Rewind, please uh, subscribe on whatever streaming platform you uh, subscribe to um, and give us a like. Uh, leave us a review. We Reviews. appreciate it. And if you have any requests for anything you want to hear us talk about, um, we do do those sometimes. So, you know, we did, a, we did a recent one on Squid Game, and we're hoping to do more user or fan-requested videos in the future down the line. So Yeah, that'd be uh, fun. Feel free to send those in. Um, and with that, I think we'll call it. Uh, we'll see you guys in two weeks uh, for the next episode of Play Pause Rewind. Mm-hmm. And we'll try to give you all some heads up about what it'll be, I guess, if, so you can <laughs> we'll watch do our it best. before. Yeah, if we remember. <laughs> all right uh have a good week everybody stay safe have fun Bye. bye